ultimately how you win does matter to God. God wanted David to be on, on the throne, and maybe he would have even accepted if, if David had taken his life, because it does say that God put Saul into his hands. Maybe that would have been acceptable. I really don't know. But whether it would be or not, the way that you conduct yourself and the rationale, the, the things that you do to get to the conclusion that you're pushing for, that matters to God a lot. In fact, I think you could make an argument that it matters more than the results. In 1775, the Continental Congress created the Chaplain Corps. Under the command of General George Washington, each soldier was required to attend worship service every Sunday. While other armies advanced on their feet, Washington's troops advanced on their knees. It's time for the Chaplain's Report with Caleb Colquitt on tactics. All right, and the chaplain's report for today. And uh, again, my technology, for whatever reason, is not not really wanting to cooperate with me. I, I guess it's because I've been gone so long, but we'll see how that goes. Uh, so I'm hoping that my ver my verses that I have planned for this work. But if you m may recall at the last time that we left, and I know that that was a while ago, David had cut off Saul's robe. And this happened when he was hiding in a cave and David just happened to be... It just happened to get just close enough to him to where he could cut off the corner of his clothing while he was in the cave uh, to, to show that he had the opportunity to kill him and refused to. And so we're going to look at the next passage in this piece of scripture that describes the next part of this. So let's go ahead and go to 1 Samuel. Oh, there it is. Good. 1 Samuel 24, verses 12 through 15. May the Lord judge between you and me. Remember, this is David speaking to Saul. May the, George, may the Lord judge between you and me, and may the Lord take vengeance on you for me, but my hand shall not be against you. As the Proverbs of ancient say, out of the wicked comes wickedness, but my hand shall not be against you. After whom has the king of Israel gone out? Whom are you pursuing? A dead dog? A single flea? May the Lord therefore be judge and decide between you and me, and may he see and plead my cause and save me from your hand. Oh, wait, that's... Oh, that, that was all of it. Okay. So, a little technological snafu, but we got through it. The point of that particular passage, do you notice in that last piece how David is actually calling out God's judgment? He is saying, may the Lord judge between me and between you. That's what I am wanting to happen. And that's really interesting because when it comes to God's judgment, especially as modern day Christians, we tend to always think of God's judgment as something terrible and scary. And by the way, it is. I'm not saying that that's an incorrect way to look at it. But if we are actually in God's favor, if we have a relationship with his son and we have been cleansed of our sins through his blood, then his judgment really isn't something that we should be afraid of. Or shouldn't be looking forward to. And David illustrates this pretty well. You see, David is so confident that he has done the right thing, that he has acted in a way that God would find acceptable, that David is saying, yeah, God, come down. Judge between the two of us. I want that to happen. That's how confident I am that I'm going to come out smelling like roses in this. And Saul is the one that has been doing things that would be contrary to your will. But I think it also illustrates the trust that David has in God. Because he not only trusts that he has, you know, quote unquote, done his part, that he has acted in a way, at least in this matter, in a way that is accepted, uh, acceptable and pleasing in God's sight. But more importantly, he trusts in God's goodness. He believes that God is a good judge, a righteous judge, and a judge that sees everything. And because of that, he is confident that the judgment is going to be correct. And even though it isn't stated outright, you know, maybe in David's mind, there is at least an inkling of an idea that maybe I did do something that isn't right. I don't think that that's the overwhelming thought. I, I think it's pretty clear that he thinks he is correct. But I think that there is also a sense of, you know what? I call God's judgment down upon both of us. And if there's something that I've done wrong, so be it. It's, it's God. He will do the right thing. We'll actually see later in a passage, later on in his story, 
that when God's judgment is about to come down on David, David's reaction is, it is the Lord. He will do what's right. And so this is a mentality that David has in other parts of the scripture. And so while I'm not suggesting this is the main message of this passage, I'm saying that David had a relationship with God in such that he trusts that even when David himself messed up and was wrong, that God's judgment coming down as a corrective force was a good thing. And that God was going to do the right thing regardless of what David thought about it or what David did. And that's a confidence and a love and trust for God that most people just don't reach. I mean, every single one of us has sin in our lives, and, and sure, we are able to have that blotted out by Christ's blood, but at the end of the day, we understand that we're imperfect creatures and that we, even after being cleansed, have the capacity to sin again. And so to have that confidence that God is going to do the right thing and to call down God's judgment, wanting it to correct us, that's just something that comes with the ideology that we serve a loving, perfect, and righteous God. This concept is called vindication in the scripture, and it's also used a lot in the Psalms, which really shouldn't be surprising because we're seeing this attitude in David, and David writes definitely not all, but a large plurality of the Psalms. We're not sure exactly how many, but a lot of the Psalms are attributed to David for sure. And so because of that, I think that David is sort of giving an actual real-world example in this story. You know, whoever wrote Samuel is, is displaying that this wasn't just something that David did in his prayer life. This wasn't just something David did when he was writing Psalms. This is a belief that David held. And he believed it so much that he was willing to put his own life on the line to prove that it was correct. He believed that he was right in God's side, and, and he was willing to say, God, you judge between the two of us, and you'll do what's right. And so this isn't something that is exclusive to the Psalms either, because he does have that kind of confidence, but the guy understands judgment ultimately belongs to God. And that's another thing, too. See, he doesn't go past his own office granted to him at this moment. And remember that this is someone who has already been anointed by the prophet Samuel to be Israel's king. It would be very easy for David to justify in his own mind, look, in God's sight, I'm king, and so I have the right to kill this usurper king if I want to. And by the way, God had also said that I'm going to deliver Saul into your hand. We talked about that in one of our other passages, and so that could have also been used as a justification for David to do whatever he wanted to to Saul, but he didn't. And the reason that he didn't is pretty clear here. He says, you know what? I trust in God's judgment. So I don't have to take matters into my own hands. God is going to hash that out between the two of us at some point. And so he not only has confidence in God's promises, in God's goodness, in God's righteousness, and in his judgment, but he also believed that at the end of the day, that's just not my place. That's something that only God is supposed to do, and because of that, I'm not going to take up the role of God. I'll leave that to him. You know, there's so many people. I would say a vast majority of the population, unfortunately, and, and also, unfortunately, some people that claim to be Christians, that they spend most of their lives trying to put themselves in the role of God. See, I, I get to be my own moral arbiter. You can't tell me that this behavior is wrong because I believe that it's not, or I believe God wouldn't do that. What they've actually done is they've fashioned themselves into God, and they're just using God to try to give themselves credibility with other people. That's all that is. They're saying, well, well, God would want me to be happy, therefore I can be with this person who very clearly God would not approve me of, of being with. And it, well, God would want me to be happy, or, or God would want this for me, so yeah, it's perfectly fine that I'm married to somebody of the same sex as me. Well, well God would want this for me, or, or God would want that. That's not the way the relationship with God is supposed to work, and David gets that. David could have said, well, God wants me to be king, and he actually knew that God wanted him to be king. And use that as a justification for taking Saul's life, but he says, no, I'm not going to do it. God's going to keep his promises. He's going to do what he wants, and I'm going to leave vengeance up to God. I'm not going to raise my hand against his anointed. And I think another important part of this passage is he reiterates that, Saul, I I'm not a threat to you. You're pursuing me, the king of a nation. It's basically me and a, a band of, of random men that I've cobbled together. They don't have a chance against your army. 
You're pursuing me like a flea or a dead dog. You're engaged in this massive hunt to take me out when I pose no threat to you. And to prove that I don't, here's the corner of your robe, I was this close to you. I'm not going to hurt you. And so, even though he had the opportunity to do that, I think that's a pretty powerful message coming to Saul that what you're doing is pointless. I don't want to hurt you, and even if I did, you know, unless what hap just happened with God, uh, with God, you know, being behind it, I wouldn't stand a chance against you anyway. So, what are you doing here? And it's a good question. I think it makes Saul think. And I think that the ultimate lesson here is that David really understands that at this point, killing Saul, it's only going to breed more wickedness from him internally, but also with everybody else. History would have remembered that as just one king taking another king's life in order to take the throne. It, they wouldn't remember it the way that it's remembered now, the, the way that David is revered as, as one of the foremost Bible heroes may not have even been worthy to be the progenitor of Christ, you know, someone in the lineage of Christ. Maybe that wouldn't have been all that special if David had just taken Saul's life and taken the throne exactly like Saul would have done to him if the situation were reversed. And we know that from some of his other behavior. But ultimately, I think David understands that that's just a path to more darkness, more hatred, more violence. And if he does that, then that's all that's going to lead to. And if God's judgment removes Saul from the equation, which, you know, was a possibility and eventually did happen in a battle, David's ascension was going to be attained anyway because God already promised him. King. And so David doesn't even have to take his life because God said it was going to happen. And so regardless of what he does, when God says it, David believes it. It makes me think of this really great scene from Avatar The Last Airbender. And I don't want to have to go through the entire story, but suffice it to say there is a big bad guy that is trying to take over the world known as the Fire Lord. And he, he's trying to conquer the entire Earth, and uh, he's already conquered most of it when this conversation takes place. And there's one person that might be able to beat him. And it's his brother named Iroh. And they come to him because the Avatar, who is the only other person on Earth that really stands a chance against the Fire Lord, has gone missing and they don't know who else they can turn to. And so they go to this guy who is the Fire Lord's older brother and they ask him to beat him. And he says, look, even if I could beat him, and I'm not sure that I could, history will only remember that as one brother killing another brother for the crown. It has to be somebody else. And I think that that's the kind of mental calculus that, that David is going through here. He understands that if he kills Saul here and now, this is not going to be God taking a, a random shepherd boy from out of nowhere and elevating him to the level of king and leader of his people who will eventually bring the Christ. They'll remember David as just a bloodthirsty tyrant that did whatever it took to take what he wanted and to get his power. And in that sense, he's really not any better than Saul. And I think David understands that, which is the reason that he takes this approach. Because ultimately, how you win does matter to God. God wanted David to be on, on the throne, and maybe he would have even accepted if, if David had taken his life, because it does say that God put Saul into his hands. Maybe that would have been acceptable. I really don't know. But whether it would be or not, the way that you conduct yourself and the rationale, the, the things that you do to get to the conclusion that you're pushing for, that matters to God a lot. In fact, I think you could make an argument that it matters more than the results. And I think that David kind of proves this here because at the end of the day, this day that happened right here, David wasn't king. Now, David became king, but it was years later and through a lot of struggle and hardship. But it seems like God would have much preferred that way, the way that David chose, than David just taking Saul's life and being coronated that afternoon. Like, that's just, it seems as though that's what God would have preferred David to do. I think if I could sum this lesson up in a sentence, it would be God, or sorry, David loves God and Israel too much to kill Saul. 
David has such a love and respect for God and his wisdom and his judgment and him doing things the way that he wants, at least in this episode, that he decides that I love God too much to do things that he wouldn't approve of. Or, or that even if maybe they're quote-unquote acceptable and he would be okay with them, it's certainly not the way that God would prefer I conduct myself. And you know what? If I go through this, this is just going to cause strife for Israel. Do I want to be the kind of king that puts my nation ahead of myself or myself ahead of my nation? Because if he cares more about himself than he does his country and his people, killing Saul is the right move here. Because it's him king. But if he cares more about Israel and Israel having at least something resembling a peaceful transition and showing Israel that this is not the way we conduct ourselves in Israel. We don't act like every other paganistic nation where you just kill one another for, for, for power. That's not the way that this nation is supposed to, to operate and behave. If David wants to convey that message to his people, then killing Saul is not an option, and I think you realize that. All right, well, I will be back probably in two or three weeks. We'll have to see where it goes. I'm off to a mission trip in Ukraine, so prayers would definitely be appreciated, not only for my health, because I'm still kind of recovering a little bit, uh, but also that our mission would be fruitful and we get to spread the gospel to lots of people. Thank you so much for the prayers and thoughts over the course of time that I was sick. I, I greatly appreciate it, and I greatly appreciate Faulkner University also for helping me out with that. They were great through all this. My doctors, my nursing staff uh, couldn't have recovered without them. But ultimately, just like in the story here with David, God's will is what mattered most. And that is why I believe that the prayers absolutely helped, that you know they were something that, that really aided in my recovery, and, and I was very touched by letters and no, you know, messages that I got from people all over the state of Alabama telling me that they were praying for me. It was not really that unsimilar to what happened when I had cancer, even though, you know, that one was obviously on a much bigger scale. Uh, but I just wanted to say to the audience, thank you so much, guys. I love you. I appreciate you. And I'm sorry I haven't been able to spend more time with you like I normally do. Uh, but your prayers and, and thoughts are, are greatly appreciated, and I am grateful for them, and they do make a difference. Don't let anybody ever tell you that they don't. Stay the course, friends. If you're watching this because you liked this video, awesome. Be sure to like and subscribe and click that little notification bell. If you're a leftist that's only here to hate watch, hang on before you punch that dislike button. You see, I identify as a Hispanic woman. So if you dislike this video, that's literally violence against me and you are now guilty of a hate crime. Why do you hate beautiful trans people of color like me? What you gonna do now, Woke Brigade?